to the Republicans. Okay, then she stays, and then she's the point person for the U.S. role in the overthrow of the Ukraine government in February 2014 that starts this war, because people need to remember, just get on a website and look at it. Uh, even they're admitting it. This war didn't start in 2022 with Russia's invasion. This war started in 2014 with the violent overthrow of the Ukraine government. And go listen to Newland on tape several weeks before the overthrow, talking about who the next government would be in Ukraine. She's already plotting this with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, on a phone call that was intercepted. It's unbelievable. She was then Assistant Secretary of State for Pol European Affairs. Now she's Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. So she's that deep state, the one that transcends the political parties, that shows this is not Democrats and Republicans. This goes back to Cheney, to Bush. This goes to Obama administration. This goes right up to Biden. Come on, what is this? And we've known all along our own diplomats, William Burns, who in 2008 was the US ambassador to Russia, cabled home, and people can find it online because it was covered by WikiLeaks. They can find William Burns' email, cable, that says, my God, if we push NATO enlargement, this is absolutely a Russian red line. And the Russians have explained, don't do this, why this is so dangerous. And Newland, okay, close your eyes, just go ahead, everything will be fine. And not everything's fine. Now we're in the middle of one war and at risk of another war, and it, nothing is fine. Nothing is fine. I want to ask you, back at the debt, <laughs> on the topic of the debt, uh, there are those, Jeffrey Sachs, who say, you know what, uh, we don't have to worry about the debt, so-called debt crisis, because our dollar is not backed by gold. We can just keep printing dollars. Uh, this is, I think, modern monetary theory. We can afford whatever we want. What would you say to them? Well, it's, it's technically right. Uh, what you do, technically, the Treasury borrows from the open market, and then the Federal Reserve buys that debt from the bondholder, puts money into the economy, and takes the debt back onto the books of the Fed. So it's no longer owed to the public. The debt is now owed to another unit of the government. But what happens is the money supply has gone up. So it is printing money to finance the war. The problem with that is that Again, you can do it to an extent, but if you do it too much, you get inflation. And in 2021 and 2022, we had a blowout of the money supply. I've been uh, a monetary economist for 43 years, I mentioned, international. I never saw it. In fact, it never happened before such a large increase of the money supply. And then you start having inflation. The first inflation was that every crazy uh, crypto currency soared in value and then the stock market soared in value and asset prices soared in value and non-fungible tokens soared in value but then it got into the commodities markets now it's getting into the real you go to the grocery store it's into the real economy and so that's what happens when you print trillions of dollars which is what we did in 2021 2022 so you can do it it's just that you have consequences when you do it. Don't don't do it and think you're going to get away with it. Just uh, completely printing money. Lots of governments have tried that for actually a couple uh, millennia. It's called debasing the currency, uh, and uh, you can do it for a little while. But uh, after a while, it, you know you better pay your bills. That's that's the basic point. Thank you. For those of you who just tuned in, I'm Marcy Winograd for Code Pink Radio. I am with the distinguished Jeffrey Sachs, economist, public policy analyst who's been doing this for decades, talking about this uh, debt crisis of anywhere from $24 trillion to $31 trillion and the betrayal of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who promised that he would not deliver a blank check for military spending. And yet, uh, all 
talk of cutting the military budget has suddenly evaporated during this period in which he is negotiating with President Biden and demanding cuts in Social Security and Medicare, uh, food stamps, and so forth. Jeffrey Sachs. I wish we heard. Not- I wish we heard Biden saying, "Well, at least we'll cut the military budget." I'm not hearing that either, and no. neither of them. No. Uh, now, Jeffrey Sachs. Let's say you're in the White House. You're in the Oval Office. No, you have I heard the pen. <laughs> I'm going to put you there for right now. And uh, you can, you're meeting maybe with uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the minority leader, Hakeem Jeffries. And, and you say, look, this is out of control. This is a debt we have. Uh, we need to cut the military budget, slash it. What are you going to cut in that budget? First thing I'm going to say, you know, God, we thought we were going to bluff Putin and so forth, and just NATO enlargement was going to go on, and he called the bluff, and uh, now we're in this uh, ridiculous, horrible, tragic, destructive, expensive war. We're going to tell him, okay, no NATO enlargement, you go home. You know, in other words, we're going to negotiate the end of this, which started with these provocations uh, of overthrowing a neutral government and overthrowing uh, the uh, sanity of uh, not moving NATO right up to a nearly 2,000 kilometer border with Russia and all that. So I would stop the war through negotiation. That would be the first thing. We'd save a lot of money. Second, I would say, look, we just had the accounting by uh, CIPRI, which is the uh, Stockholm Institute that keeps track of who spends what on the military. You know, the United States is spending more than the next 10 countries combined. And I'm talking about China uh, among those countries. We're spending three times China's military spending. We're spending more than the next 10 countries combined. Let's get this under control. Then I would point out that we have 800 military bases abroad. China, one or two, depending on how you count, maybe a small one in Djibouti. Uh, maybe uh, one or two others. We have 800. Okay, we don't need 800 for our security. It's not adding to our security, it's adding to our debt enormously. So let's get this under control. Let's take out an Excel spreadsheet also and do this right. Real numbers, not gimmicks. Let's see what we need to do in taxes because God, there's so many loopholes here that it's unbelievable. But at the same time, Let's stop waste on the, not just waste, tragic spending on the military industrial complex, because that is where we have wasted so much of our money. Yes. And when we create, create, I don't like that word has a positive connotation, but when we produce or the the military contractors who are really making a killing off of killing, when they produce new weapon systems, these systems emit tremendous greenhouse gases. So there is that connection. And too often, we see environmentalists and peace activists operating in silos. And at Code Pink, we have a War Is Not Green campaign because we think it's essential that we integrate these campaigns because the military is a driver of the climate crisis. The Pentagon is the single largest global institutional emitter of greenhouse gases, consumer of oil and fossil fuels. And too much of that is under the radar. So let's talk about it. Uh, Now, let's also talk about what we're doing at Code Pink. This week and next week, we have uh, grassroots activists on the on the hill on Capitol Hill, Medea Benjamin, Olivia Dinucci, which uh, who many people met uh, when she disrupted. Uh, well, she's <laughs> she's disrupted a few times those powers that be that insist on you know, all of this uh, never-ending spending for the military, including Joe Biden. Uh, so anyway, they're going to be on Capitol Hill with others visiting key lawmakers' offices and saying, "Look, this is our petition, Code Pink." is a partner in the Peace in Ukraine Coalition, which represents over 100 organizations. We have a petition calling on Biden, Putin, and Zelensky to support a ceasefire and peace negotiations now. And I thank you, Jeffrey Sachs, because you are one of the prominent signers of that petition, along with others such as Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, Dr. Cornell West, Anne Wright, Jack Matlock, the former ambassador to the Soviet Union, even Roger Waters, the uh, co-founder of Pink yeah. Floyd has, has signed that, as well as Dennis Kucinich, one of my heroes, 
uh, who was in Congress for many years and, and a great peace champion. So we are taking this ceasefire petition not only to offices on Capitol Hill, but also fanning out across the country to deliver it to congressional offices, along with a, a full page ad that ran in the New York Times last week. Thank you very much, Eisenhower Media Network. And this ad said, let the United States be a force for peace in the world instead of, well, I'm adding this now, instead of a force for war and destruction. Uh, there are those, however, Jeffrey Sachs, you know, there are those who disagree with this call for a ceasefire. They think it's controversial. They say, no, we cannot have a ceasefire because then Russia, Putin would end up with this annexed territory in the Donbass and in Crimea, whether that was an annexation or reunification, certainly up for debate. Uh, what would you say to them? I think it's really important to get to negotiations and to understand the roots of this war. This war came because we kept pushing NATO. And at the end of 2021, Putin put on the table, actually, you want to avoid war, here is a draft Russia-US security treaty. And it had several points, the most important of which is stop the NATO expansion. And you know what the White House said? No way we're going to talk to Russia about NATO expansion. That's our business. It has nothing to do with Russia. Of course, it has to do with Russia. We we're about to put NATO right up against the Russian border. And so this was calamitously misguided foreign policy in the United States. And it's not just me saying it. The leading American diplomats have been saying this for decades now. Don't do this. George Kennan, William Burns, who's our CIA director right now, warned about this in 2008. And uh, William Perry, who was our Clinton's uh, Secretary of Defense, nearly resigned over Clinton deciding to enlarge NATO because Perry was saying, don't, we're going to start another Cold War with Russia. So it's possible to negotiate. But it's actually been, strangely enough, the United States that has absolutely rejected diplomacy. Uh, Americans probably couldn't believe that, but it's actually true. And it's at least two recent occasions. One is at the end of 2021, when Putin was putting a diplomatic initiative on the table. And we said, no, we're not going to talk about it. NATO enlargements, none of your business. That's what we told the Russians. And then at the start of the invasion, just a couple weeks after the invasion, Zelensky said, all right, OK, we can think about neutrality. We should negotiate. Now, I know what happened there because I've spoken to people that were deeply involved in this. Right at the beginning, the Ukrainians said, you know, we could really go to we don't have to be in NATO, we could have uh, guarantees uh, from other ways. And the Russians said, OK, let's talk. And the Turkish di diplomats said, we'll mediate. And so real mediation started. And, and actually, the former prime minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, got into the act as an informal mediator. Towards the end of March 2022, they actually we're working on the draft agreement to end the war. I'm talking about more than a year ago. And the United States said no. The United States said no diplomacy. Nobody questioned that in the mainstream media here because when's the last time you read in the New York Times a, a real understanding of this war? It doesn't exist in the New York Times. They just want you to follow what the US government says and so if the U.S. government says it's all Russia, they don't want to negotiate, okay, then the New York Times will say it's all Russia, they don't want to negotiate. But for those of us who are there watching, seeing, talking, it's so different. We could negotiate this till today, and we're not even trying. And we're not trying because Victoria Nuland doesn't want to try. Every, well, time I... this issue, every time this issue of negotiation comes up, she says, no, 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 it's not the time. And, and actually, when General Milley said 
this is the time for negotiation. <laughs> it was, I think, it was the uh, Under Secretary of State that said about the joint, the general, the the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. No, 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 no. He's wrong. This is not the time to negotiate. Come on, let's get serious. Yeah. Seymour Hersh's account, and then discuss it. So they're not even covering the news and much less challenging a critical thought. And that, yes, I, that's, I, I would that's agree. pretty they, they, serious. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and their coverage of what's happening in Ukraine have really assigned themselves to irrelevancy because they are Pentagon PR flax who just repeat talking points. And there's no serious investigation into any aspect of this war. And that's why, you know, at Code Pink, we support alternative uh, non-corporate journalism. Uh, please tell others, Code Pink Radio will tell you the truth. Now, Jeffrey Sachs, let's talk about China a little bit further. Yep. Uh, China has come out with a 12-point peace proposal, which Biden immediately dismissed as, what did he say? He was, said it was irrational. Uh, frankly, his response was irrational. Uh, and meanwhile, we've had actual Code, Code Pink members have met with representatives of China in Washington, D.C., to thank the Chinese government for uh, coming up with this peace plan and for playing a positive, a peacemaker's role. I mean, whatever people think about China and, and whatever criticisms they have, uh, I think we have to be very clear that China, as you mentioned, has well, maybe one or two overseas bases. It's not a, a threat militarily, and it is trying to play the role of peacemaker, not just in the Middle East, but also in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that China, the global South, can make a difference here? I mean, because it's not just China, it's Mexico, it's Brazil, it's other countries, too, that are saying we need a ceasefire. We need it now because they know the security of not just Ukraine and Russia and the United States is at stake, but the security of the entire globe. First, I think people should understand a basic fact about China. China has not engaged in one overseas war in the last 40 years, while the United States has been engaged in non-stop wars. We keep pointing our finger at China. Look at how militaristic. We vastly outspend China on the military. We have surrounded China with military bases. We've been engaged in constant wars. We are trying right now to break the Chinese economy. And uh, then we point our finger like the G7 did uh, in this recent meeting in just a kind of a hate-filled, ignorant session. Look at how evil China is. Look at how evil China is. It's so low level for anyone who really follows this. I was uh, actually myself in China last month. I've been to China so many times over the last 40 years. We're in a propaganda field right now of anti-China propaganda that has no basis in reality. And we're trying to create an enemy there so we can crush China because they're daring to achieve economic development. So this is the starting point. Now, in terms of China's uh, peace plan, it has one crucial point. And it says that a peace agreement should respect the security interests of all parties. What does that mean? That's code for don't expand NATO because Russia understandably regards that as a direct security threat. To have NATO weapons on Russia's 1,900 kilometer border with Ukraine is not what Russia would like. Just like we would not be thrilled with Russian bases in Mexico or in Canada or any place else nearby. That's what Russia is trying to tell us. China gets it. China just uses very Confucian, if I could say, very nice orderly words, respect to the security interests of all parties. And that means to the United States, would you, would you understand the, what, what Russia has been saying to the US since Russia was independent December 
1991. Don't enlarge NATO. And especially since 2008. By God, not to Georgia. Are you kidding? That's what they've been telling us. And China gets it. And that's why Biden immediately rejected it. Because this is a game. The game is Newland's game to expand NATO to Ukraine. You know, okay. I think a lot of people don't realize, Jeffrey Sachs, that this has been a long time coming, not just in terms of, you know, beginning in 2004 with the with the greatest expansion of NATO, but also in 2020, we had uh, NATO recognize Ukraine as what I call a de facto member uh, with this interoperability agreement saying, you know, we're going to integrate our armed forces. Uh, now, what's the difference between being a de facto uh, member of NATO and an official member of NATO? Well, it could be what you're talking about, bases. It could be nuclear weapons. People say, well, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. First of all, they should all give them up, right? Uh, we should be pushing for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which NATO emphatically opposes. So NATO... Uh, and by the, the way, if I may just... Yeah, weapons. if I may just say that I'm under the... <laughs> the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which we are a major signatory, we are bound to nuclear disarmament. But we're not even trying right now. So we're not even uh, honoring the treaties that we're in, much less joining the treaties that we ought to be joining. So this is a, a terrible thing. And by the way, that's a huge budget cost. That is hundreds of billions of dollars that we're spending on, quote, modernizing the nuclear weapons rather than negotiating nuclear disarmament. So that's another part to come yeah. back to the budget story of the past. Mm -hmm. But th this story of NATO goes back actually to the early 1990s. I spoke with a hist wonderful historian uh, recently who told me that in documents that he is reviewing, he hasn't published yet, Ukraine was already on a list for NATO enlargement in 1992. Now, that's, you know, years before Putin's anywhere around uh, on this. This is a plan that goes back to the neocons with Cheney and Wolfowitz uh, in and Rumsfeld in the Bush administration. So this goes back. A, and now, I'll, interestingly, if you look up it's, it's a fascinating article. Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997 in Foreign Affairs magazine, mind you, this is before Putin's president by years. In 1997, Zbigniew Brzezinski spells out the timeline for expanding NATO to Ukraine. And he says almost exactly the sequence as it actually happened, because what he was writing in 1997 was not just his ideas, he was writing what was already in the works inside the government. So this is a story that goes back 25 years at least, and it's been hidden from the American people. And they thought they'd get it on a bluff. The real idea of the United States was, What's, what's Putin going to do? We're going to expand NATO, and what's he going to do? And he's going to complain, and we're going to say it's none of your business, and we're going to expand. And that was really their idea. Then Yanukovych got in the way. Yanukovych, president of Ukraine, who said, no, I don't want Ukraine to be in, in uh, NATO. That's very dangerous. We'll be neutral. Well, <laughs> the U.S. helped get rid of him. So this is a long, long story. None of it told honestly to the American people. And then if you say it now that this had something to do with the war, try to get it published in the New York Times. You can't. Jeffrey, people say, I've heard this over and over again, and they quote different people, unnamed people, I won't give them the credit here. Uh, they say, look, the reason why Putin has not invaded Poland, let's say, is because Poland is a member of NATO. So Ukraine needs this protection. If <laughs> If Ukraine were a member, an official, not just a de facto or interoperability uh, member of NATO, then Putin never would have invaded. That's possible. But you know what? Uh, the way we did it, we virtually guaranteed a war. Period. In other words, uh, to say, okay, Ukraine, uh, yeah, you're going to join NATO. 
and the Russians are saying against our border? No. And then letting, as this uh, occurred, they said, you keep pushing this, uh, we're going to have war. And the war started in 2014 because the safety for Ukraine was when Ukraine was saying, we don't even want it. Stop. Don't don't get us into the middle of this war between the two of you. So the fact of the matter is this NATO enlargement was completely unnecessary and provocative all the way back to the 1990s. And then we saw in but, 2019, but, but just Ukraine to say, embedded in its constitution this well, about yeah, NATO. Ju just to say, even the first round, which was Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, the Russians hated it, but it didn't cause a war. That's far from their borders. Then the next round came, and the Russians were really, really annoyed because that one was on their border with the Baltics. So it was Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And then they said, oh, come on, what do you stop? Then in 2007, Putin said, okay, you've done it. You keep expanding NATO. You promised you wouldn't, but you keep doing it. Stop, do not come up to our border with Ukraine and Georgia. And by the way, people should take a map out and understand a little bit about this. The real goal of these neocons, the Newland neocons, is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is why, where does Georgia come in here? I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, Georgia is a country in the Caucasus. Where does that come from? If you look at a map, the idea of these neocons is that you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey and Georgia surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And Putin's saying, don't do this, stop. And he says this in 2007. Then in 2008, Bush pushes this and Newland is key member of the administration then. And they push this over the opposition of the Europeans and get the Bucharest NATO declaration to declare that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, will. And by the way, Biden has been part of this all along. And the military industrial complex has pushed this. The, lo the literal lobbies for NATO enlargement have been Raytheon people. I mean, you can't make this up. This is how the US government works. Lastly, Raytheon Jeffrey Sachs, yes. I wanna ask you about Ukraine and the future of Ukraine. Should we continue on this? Uh calamitous path of endless war, uh, funding the, propping up the Ukrainian government to, to the tune of $6 billion a month, spending over $115 billion to continue the war, half of that going to military contractors for weapons and, and military training. Uh, meanwhile, uh, what's going to happen to the Ukrainian economy? Because we've already read about Zelensky privatizing a lot of these industries that were nationalized under the Soviet Union. And we know that BlackRock, representatives of BlackRock have been over in Ukraine. And we know that Zelensky has a website and on the website, there's a menu for privatizing Ukraine and, and inviting investors to, yes, invest in the military in Ukraine. Where do you see this going? Should we continue on this course? Look, Ukraine is being destroyed. This is the first tragedy is for Ukraine itself <clears throat> being a place where the U.S. wages a proxy war is the worst place you can be. As, as Kissinger famously said, you know, to be an enemy of the United States uh, is dangerous, but to be a friend can be fatal. We are killing Ukraine. Literally, we're killing Ukrainians, but we're killing Ukraine. Think of how we loved Afghanistan how we love South Vietnam. What do we do, Iraq? If, you're, if you are the place where the US is waging a proxy war, first of all, you will be physically destroyed. You will have mass out migration of young people, of talented people, of people just trying to survive for God's sake. You'll have your infrastructure destroyed. All of this, the, the Ukrainian economy is busted and the, the Ukrainian population has 
shrunk tremendously because people have left the country. And so this is in no way helping Ukraine. This is just, I tried to tell the Ukrainians, I'm, I'm for you, I'm not against you. This is, they kept thinking, oh, that's Putin propaganda. I said, no, listen, I go back to the Vietnam War in the United States, to Iraq, Afghanistan. I've seen what happens when the US grabs you in a proxy war. And this is what's happening right now to Ukraine. It's being tragically destroyed. And every time things don't work, our side ratchets up and they keep ratcheting up. And sad to say, you know, Obama knew in 2014, he, he got the main point when he said and realized that Russia has what's called escalatory dominance. What that means is Russia can meet us and raise the bet. Because for Russia, this is existential. For us, it's another war. Okay, we're gonna expand NATO here. We're gonna expand NATO there. We're gonna do whatever we wanna do. For Russia, they view this as the essence of Russia's national security. They have 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons. Obama realized this, said, I don't want to even start down this path. I don't know what this administration is doing. They have no plan. It's all, it's phony. It, and phony in the sense that they have no route to success, but they're in it up to their necks right now. Worse than that, <laughs> for Ukraine, they're in it above their heads. They're drowning in this violence. We've got to stop the fighting because there is no military path to victory because Russia can escalate and can escalate to devastation. And we keep and we were told, oh, don't say that. Don't 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 mention nuclear weapons and so forth. <clears throat> you know what? Mention them. Understand. Yes. And I think understand we should also this. I think we should also mention, Jeffrey Sachs, that the United States says in nuclear posture review, the Biden administration says we will use nuclear weapons of first course. if our allies' interests are threatened. So, you know, who's going to use them first or will they be used? All of this is speculation, but it's frightening that we are escalating right now, training Ukrainians on F-16 fighter jets that could... Uh, After they said again Russia. and again that they wouldn't do it, they keep right. taking the next step. It's time for the Newland administration really to step down so that we can have peace and have some sanity. In the world is diminished. There's no doubt that China is a, another option for countries. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, most uh, of the developing world does not want a US led hegemony anyway, but it was living with one or at least with the US intention of one. And the rise of China changes this uh, fundamentally uh, because now the balance of power is much more dispersed. Uh, the BRICS countries have an output when measured in purchasing power prices that is even slightly larger than the G7 right now. Of course, the BRICS have many more people than the G7, so the per capita income in the G7 is much higher. But just the BRICS is uh, a larger block, around 32% of world output compared to 31% of world output of the G7. US-China tensions have been rising since 2014 and my view is that the U.S. security state already uh, around 2015 began to uh, push for measures to, in the American mindset, contain China. Uh, I think uh, there was a change of mindset around that time in the American political and security leadership that said China's continued rise is no longer in America's interest. And uh, a series of measures have been implemented since 2015 that really aim to hinder 
China's economy and according to the U.S. hinder China's military capacity, but I think it's more general than that. And those measures include, of course, trying to establish a trans-Pacific partnership that would exclude China, rather extraordinary in my mind, almost laughable to make a, an, a Pacific Basin trading system designed to exclude China as if somehow the Chinese economy wasn't there and the 1.4 billion people of China were not there. Of course, the U.S. is constructing new alliances like AUKUS, uh, the uh, Australia, UK, U.S. Uh, grouping to uh, base uh, nuclear submarines in Australia, ostensibly to police uh, the South China Sea. Uh, the U.S. has imposed technology barriers on China, financial barriers on China. Uh, the U.S. has uh, targeted leading Chinese enterprises like Huawei and ZTE. Uh, the U.S. is going after TikTok, uh, and uh, now it's going after the cloud services of uh, Alibaba <coughs> and uh, other major tech companies in China. So why is it doing this? In my view, it is uh, mainly a misguided uh, and a dangerous approach uh, to try to maintain U.S. predominance over China. Uh, I think that it is both wrongly directed and almost sure to fail uh, because China is very successful society and successful economy with a lot of dynamism, with a lot of scientific and research capacity, with a lot of friends around the world. And the, U the U.S. idea of dominance is not very attractive to most of the world. Most of the world would like good relations with the U.S., but not a U.S. that is dominant I don't know of countries that are willing to make sacrifices for U.S. dominance other than uh, the close U.S. allies. So when it comes to certainly Chile or Mercosur, Latin America more generally, or Unisur, the goal for sure is to keep good, open trade relations and financial relations and technology relations with China and to aim to do the same with the United States and with Europe. I don't think that there is any remotely sensible policy other than the South American countries saying, of course, we trade with China normally. Of course, we're partners with China, but we're also partners with the US and Europe. And we see absolutely no reason to choose sides. And we don't want to be pushed to choose sides. I personally see nothing nefarious in any of China's initiatives, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or others. And I don't believe the Western press, which I regard as mostly propaganda, that the Belt and Road Initiative is a debt trap or Chinese companies are especially harmful to uh, host countries and so forth. So I don't view this as a complicated question, actually, in its substance. I, I see the U.S. changed its attitude. And when I say the U.S., I mean the security establishment, uh, which runs the U.S. government foreign policy, changed its attitude to China eight years ago. I do not believe that China provoked that. I don't think it was in response to hostile action from China. I think it was in response to China's success rather than to hostility from China. So I would encourage Chile and Latin America to keep open trade. Every day I say in the United States, maintain relations with China, stop trying to provoke a conflict over Taiwan, stop sending arms to Taiwan. Don't do in Taiwan what we did in Ukraine, which was to create the provocations that led to war, because I also believe that the Ukraine war was caused by U.S. provocations 
not by Russian uh, imperial design. Of course, most American leaders violently disagree with me, or maybe not violently, but uh, uh, strongly disagree with me, but I'm old enough that I understand them at this point <laughs> after almost 50 years of watching US foreign policy, and I think they're wrong, and I think they're provocative. And I don't want them to do the same thing in Taiwan that they've done in Ukraine, uh, which is pump in a lot of arms and then express surprise when a war starts. Uh, but that's a possibility that would be a terrible possibility. I believe the US sanction regimes in general are illegal. Uh, I do not uh, abide by unilateral coercive measures. My understanding of international law, as reflected in annual votes by the UN General Assembly, is that such sanctions policies are uh, not valid unless adopted by the UN. So I would hope that Latin America would not get trapped in sanctions regimes, but basically would also take the position that nobody can sanction Chile's trade with China and by the way, Chile's trade with Russia or others, though it's not as important, um, because uh, if there are to be such sanctions, they're only valid if they're undertaken under the UN Charter, essentially by the UN Security Council. So that's my general view. Uh, and my general belief is that trade between South America and China should be strong and I think it will be mutually beneficial. Uh, Latin America, of course, has a resource base, which is very complementary to China's. Uh, China likes wonderful wine, uh, great fruits, uh, minerals, many uh, wonderful things that Chile uh, specializes in producing. Uh, it needs those things. Uh, and um, I think that uh, it will trade and uh, help uh, enrich Chile doing so. Uh, at the same time, uh, China has some excellent low cost infrastructure technologies that I think can be a very great benefit for South America uh, in terms of rolling out 5G, in terms of uh, an integrated zero carbon power system. China is very good at long distance uh, uh, direct current high voltage transmission uh, to build a, an integrated South America wide zero carbon power system, which Chile could be a very important uh, energy provider uh, to such a system. And so I see many complementarities that are very strong and hope that uh, Latin America's and South America's uh, uh, trade, finance, diplomatic, uh, relations with China remain uh, strong and uh, and dynamic. Maybe I'll just stop at that point. Has been raised by the New York Times in its editorials, in its opinion columns of the New York Times columnists like Tom Friedman and others, and in the invited op-eds. And you just can't get a word in. Otherwise, you can't tell that readership you were just describing in Manhattan, where I happen to live, what's really going on. So th this is the frightening part. And we're also told, Glenn, which is pretty damn weird, don't worry about nuclear escalation. Don't be blackmailed by this. My advice is worry and worry a lot. And if you have uh, been around these issues for a while, and I have for decades, and I wrote a book about the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and. Kennedy's uh, successful quest to negotiate a partial nuclear test ban treaty with Nikita Khrushchev, you know, if you're not worried, you just don't get it because you better be worried. And I'm very worried about this administration not getting it. You know, it's, it was such a staple of Cold War culture, Cold War policy, that avoiding nuclear war was the single greatest priority as we were going around the world with these proxy conflicts against the Soviet Union. We managed never to directly engage them militarily. And even then, misperception, miscommunication did bring the world close to nuclear annihilation, at least on two occasions, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And yet it really does amaze me 
that we seem to have just kind of through, I don't know, inertia or lethargy or historical ignorance come to view the risk of nuclear war as basically a fiction, as kind of assigning zero value to it, or even this kind of macho attitude that we're not going to be deterred by the country, a country having nuclear weapons. Talk a little bit about, you know, in the time that you've been working in all the things that I discussed in these kind of geopolitical uh, framework, even from an economics perspective, the specter of nuclear war and how it used to be kind of important for people and policymakers in deciding what they would and wouldn't do. You know, there was one moment when uh, Biden was caught on tape saying, uh, you know, we're on a path to Armageddon. Uh, this is, uh, I think it was the fall of uh, 2022. 2021, if I remember. No, 2022. Or, or 2022. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. 2022. Excuse me. Uh, and you know, he was excoriated by the press the next day <laughs> rather than anybody reflecting, oh, my God, the president of the United States is saying this. He was excoriated. How dare he say this? You know, he let a tiny glimmer of the truth in. And then, of course, the whole idea was shut that up. Don't talk about that. Well, anyone that knows some history, and by the way, if you want to know some history, the most wonderful book written about this by a great historian is a book called Gambling with Armageddon by a late great historian, Martin Sherwin, who wrote about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the whole atomic age, in fact. And the book is terrifying because we came so close 60 years ago, uh, actually 61 years ago now, to nuclear annihilation. And almost every one of Kennedy's aides would have pushed us to that. We fortunately had uh, a president who uh, had the sense uh, to avoid uh, the ultimate disaster, but almost none of his aides had that sense. And what Sherwin recalls and what we've learned from Dan Ellsberg and from so many others is how close we've come and how easy it is to come close because there's so many stupid people in our government. Believe me, this is something I can tell you. Absolutely. People who don't think, who are extraordinarily lacking in basic common sense, who believe that power is the only coin of the realm, uh, who uh, believe you really do have to be tough on whatever it is and Nuclear war will see them down. And uh, all of this is uh, extraordinarily reckless, and we're really in it now. And it's, of course, not just Ukraine. It's Nancy Pelosi flying to Taiwan. Uh, it's uh, us doing whatever we can to humiliate China. It's having an absurd G7 meeting last week in Hiroshima, of all place, places uh, that the U.S of course, uh, bombed with the first nuclear uh, atomic bomb, uh, spending the whole G7 in essence to attack China and Russia. They, they think it maybe they think it plays politics. They think it's a game. It's extraordinarily reckless and extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily predictable what's going on. Yeah. Because the, the, the real diplomats inside the U.S. have been warning about this for decades. We're only finding some of it out by WikiLeaks and by, uh, by disclosures such as uh, Bill Burns, their CIA director, who was in 2008 the U.S. ambassador to Russia. And he sent a memo that everybody should read. To Condoleezza Rice. 2008, yeah, he explained... My God, this NATO enlargement business is absolutely dangerous. And, of course, George Kennan a decade earlier, and George Kennan was absolutely brilliant and understood already in the 50s how we could have gotten out of the Cold War. But certainly in 1997, he wrote an op-ed in, in The New York Times when they still ran such op-eds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, this whole NATO enlargement business was absolutely reckless. And what's interesting, when Kennan was writing that in 1997, 
I hadn't actually realized it until I went back and saw a reference to uh, an article in Foreign Affairs by Zvig Brzezinski that I didn't remember, writing in 1997, laying out almost the precise timetable for how we were going to incorporate Ukraine into NATO. Now, this is years before Putin's president. This is when we're not having any uh, war with Russia. People tell me, oh, yeah, well, they have to be in NATO. Look at Putin, uh, you know, madman. But this is well before, and Brzezinski lays out basically to the year the sequence of how it's going to be the first uh, row of countries, which was Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. Then it's going to be the next row. Then Ukraine, by 2005 to 2010, he writes, they're going to have their invitation. It turned out to be 2008. Our ambassador to NATO in 2008 was none other than Victoria Nuland. If you want to know what deep state means, she's been in every administration. She's been almost every night. Except Trump. when Trump but was elected. Was, That's the only exactly, way, apparently, to get her out of the government. Except, except Trump. Yeah. So she was Cheney's advisor. She was ambassador to NATO when we asked Ukraine to come in. She was the point person on the U.S. engagement in the violent overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014, which started the war in Ukraine, and she is now promoted for all of this, uh, bringing us ever closer to disaster, and by the way, putting Ukraine in the classic place in a proxy war guaranteed to destroy that country, which is exactly what it's doing. You know, the thing that struck me so much about that Bill Burns memo in 2008 when he was warning Condoleezza Rice and others in the Bush administration about the insanity of this plan was he said, it isn't just Putin. You go and talk to every single person of influence in Moscow, even Putin's liberal critics, and it's all, for every last one of them, a huge red line to be mucking around in Ukraine for the West, in part because of the history of the 20th century. And that's what I wanted to ask you. You gave this interview in February of 2023 with Isaac Chadner of The New Yorker, who has been kind of come this hero to the liberal establishment because of these adversarial interviews he purportedly does. A lot of it is based on how transcripts get edited, how much he gets to say, how much the guest gets to say. I've done a couple of those with him, so I know firsthand. Um, one of the points what a low you life what a low life approach to journalism. Uh, by the way. Completely, it's completely. I mean, it, it, it. I mean, I, my, my night failed ended up being pretty fair, but I've seen him done incredible hatchet jobs with others, including yours, because one of the points you kept trying to make was that the premises of his questions embedded in them, they were almost like, when did you stop feeding your wife questions, were so misguided because he was distorting the history of the conflict, in part by thinking the war began either in 2022 or even in 2014 with Crimea, and you kept pointing it out, actually, the start of the war is 2013 with this change of government that he was shocked you called a coup, or even before with NATO expansion, even before it got to Ukraine. So talk about those parts of the history that the New York Times, the New York, the New Yorker editors didn't allow you to have included in that article and why you think that history is so important to understanding how we're being propagandized about the conflict now. Well, it's, it's a, a little amazing to be the New Yorker of all places. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say of all places, but Remnick's New Yorker is, uh, is absolutely neocon beginning to end. The New York Times is uh, completely neocon. I don't know if they would be, by the way. If I, I can't figure it out if it's just anti-Trump, pro-Biden, or they really believe the stuff that they say, but they're absolutely unwilling to listen or to learn a fact. The thing that surprised me about Chotner was just how he knew nothing and kept making aggressive assertions. And when you tried to say something, it was just snark. So it was a really weird, <laughs> weird experience. Well, explain to that not audience not that loves it. Like, you know, they assume all of his assumptions that he's getting from the New York Times. That's the full extent of their worldview. You kept trying to inject an alternative historical understanding, but it never made it into the article, which is why I'd love for you to offer it now about the importance of 2013 and that change of government. And even kind of going back to when NATO started expanding after the reunification of Germany eastward toward the Soviet or toward Russia. 
Well, it, you know, I, I posted a piece on common dreams, which people can take a look at to get a lot of the hyperlinks and a lot of the underlying data and evidence. But this story really goes back 34 years. Uh, it goes back to 1989, 1990. Uh, the U.S. was and Germany were both very clear to Gorbachev, who was a godsend for the world, by the way, because he really was a man of peace. And I was profoundly honored to try to help uh, him uh, in, on the economic side, though the White House was having none of it at the time. But in any event, Gorbachev believed in peace and he unilaterally disbanded the Warsaw Pact, which was the, the Soviet side NATO. And uh, uh, Baker uh, and uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher, the German foreign minister, repeated <laughs> time and again to Gorbachev and in many, many different forms, and so did the NATO secretary general and others, we will not move NATO one inch eastward. We won't do it. Now, I spoke to a wonderful historian uh, who is working on this right now who tells me that in the archives he's come across in 1992, not only the plans for NATO expansion, but Ukraine already on the list for NATO expansion in 1992, when supposedly in the public, there is no such thing as NATO expansion at all. But remember 1992, that was Cheney, Wolfowitz uh, and Rumsfeld in, in, uh, in, the, in the Bush senior administration, I thought, what could be worse? Well, we kept learning. <laughs> Things can get worse. <laughs> right, right. If, 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 and, and, and in the Democratic Party, the, 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 the love affair with the so-called liberal hegemony, I don't know what the liberal part is, but I know what the hegemony part is, uh, that has been Newland's uh, thing, and of course her husband uh, Robert Kagan's thing uh, for decades. This has been underway since the early 19. 90s. Now, the Russians have been saying, and Gorbachev said, don't move eastward. We want peace. We want openness. I was actually advisor to Gorbachev. I was economic advisor to Yeltsin. I was economic advisor to Leonid Kuchma, first president of independent Ukraine. I've seen all of these people. You know what they wanted? They wanted normal life. They wanted to stop the Cold War. They did not want crazy things. They wanted normalcy. And we wouldn't give it what we said. Normalcy, yeah, that's U.S. hegemony. That's U.S. indispensable power. That's U.S. we do what we want anywhere we want when we want it. And that has been the story all along. And frankly, I couldn't imagine it at the time because I was watching with my own eyes as a young guy. Suddenly, the world had a chance for peace. And peace didn't mean US global hegemony. Peace meant normal cooperation. But we couldn't accept the deal of just being normal and cooperative. We had to say, now we lead on everything. And that's been the story since the beginning. Now, there are many steps to it. Uh, Clinton was the, the first violator of the, the, the promises, and Clinton's so inconsistent on everything, but this is one of the things he was inconsistent on. Uh, so the first NATO expansion took place under Clinton, uh, and uh, that was uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. The next NATO expansion, seven countries by Bush Jr. in 2004, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Romania and Bulgaria on the Black Sea. So you had the Baltic states, you had Romania and Bulgaria, you're starting to, you know, right up against Russia, uh, Slovakia and Slovenia. Now, Putin says in 2007, stop already, stop. He says it in a famous speech uh, at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. We don't listen at all. 2008, Bush says NATO is going to enlarge to Ukraine. The European leaders, by the way, were aghast. And the, one of the European top leaders at the time called me, said, what is your president doing? Of course, European leaders don't say any of this publicly. 
but they say privately, this is crazy. This is so dangerous. But of course, they were quiet. Bush pushed this through in 2008. Then there was a reprieve for Ukraine. The reprieve was that the president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, said, look, we're in between two giants. We don't want to be smashed in the middle. We take neutrality. But neutrality was a red flag for Victoria Nuland and, uh, and her friends. And so at the end of 2013, when demonstrations against the decision that Yanukovych had made to postpone signing an agreement with EU started protests, believe me, the U.S. covertly and overtly and every other way stirred that up massively. But in January and February 2014, they supported a violent insurrection that overthrew Yanukovych. And of course, notoriously, Newland was caught on tape, something we don't talk about, but anyone go listen she to it. She picked the she's, next leader. She picked the new leader. She, she... She's planning the government weeks before the overthrow, calling exactly who would be the prime minister, by the way. It's amazing. But the whole thing is amnesia. Don't talk about any of this, so though it's so obvious. And I had a weird experience personally, which was that when the government was overthrown and Yanukovych fled and Yatsenuk was prime minister, just as uh, Newland said, I got a call. Yatsenuk wants to meet you. It's a deep economic crisis. Okay, you know, I actually respond to those things when a government says we're in a very deep financial crisis. So I flew to Kiev and I, I had an NGO brag to me about the role they played in the overthrow. And it was ugly. It left me shaking as, you know, the kind of thing you just want to wash that off. Don't tell me this awful stuff. You had no business being part of a violent insurrection, but that's the role we played. I went home. I didn't go back. I was disgusted by the whole thing, but it was obvious then. We were on a path towards war. This didn't start with a, quote, unprovoked invasion February 24th, 2022, uh, uh, 21, sorry. Uh, no, 22, excuse me. Uh, this started in February 2014. And it started with the U.S. participation in a coup. Welcome to Book Club with uh, Jeffrey Sachs. I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, one of uh, the world's leading experts on international relations and uh, one of uh, the most important voices in uh, public affairs uh, in the world today. With me, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, also a good friend and somebody that I admire tremendously. Uh, Professor Mearsheimer has a very important uh, new book uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Sebastian Rosado, who uh, is a professor uh, at University of Notre Dame. And Professor Mearsheimer is uh, the uh, R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished uh, Professor uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm sure that uh, most or all of you have been listening to uh, John Mearsheimer uh, discuss the events around uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, now wars in the Middle East and so many other issues because he's been the go-to person uh, for so much of the world in trying to make sense of uh, the multiple crises that we're in and uh, the spread of violence. One of uh, John's uh, truly justifiably famous uh, books is The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, uh, which was written at the start of the new century. And in that book, he said uh, that it seems a little quiet now, but don't worry, or worry maybe, I should say, uh, great power politics uh, will return. Uh, and uh, the book's title that I'm going to discuss uh, with you, John, also uh, 
uh, is uh, about the tragedy of great power politics, and we seem to have a lot of uh, tragedy to go around right now. But the new book uh, that you've written is, uh, of course, completely, uh, completely relevant for uh, our current uh, struggles and uh, trials and tribulations uh, globally. It, it's about how states think. And uh, the gist of uh, the book is about uh, whether state decision-making is rational or irrational and what difference it makes. You started writing this uh, during COVID, during the lockdown. So this is a book that you and uh, Sebastian Rosado uh, wrote, as I understand it, largely uh, on Zoom. Uh, together uh, during uh, the first couple of years of uh, the, uh, the the pandemic, but it became uh, absolutely pressingly relevant in trying to understand uh, the Ukraine war. So maybe uh, if we could start, uh, you could explain the motivation for this book. Uh, you're known as uh, our nation's leading realist a thinker in international relations, so it would be good to help listeners understand how you fit into the story and uh, your your views about this. But what's the motivation of writing a book called "How Nations"? Uh, how, how? Excuse me. How uh, states think? Well, there is a widespread perception uh, in the academic world and in the policy world uh, that states. Uh, in terms of their foreign policy behavior are irrational or non-rational. And our view was that if that is the case, most of our theories in international relations about how the world works uh, are largely irrelevant because all of those theories are based on the rational actor assumption. Then we also said to ourselves that if you're a policymaker and you think that states are irrational, how can you possibly formulate some sort of coherent policy? Because you have no idea what other states are going to do, because they're basically irrational. They're wild and crazy. And our intuition, uh, in fact, our theories about how the world works, say that states are rational. So what we decided to do was try to figure out whether states are routinely rational or routinely non-rational. And to do that, you have to have a definition of what rationality is, because that has to be the baseline that you then employ to look at past state behavior and determine whether or not states have been rational or not. So what we do in the book is we explore what rationality is, and, uh, and then we look at the historical record, and we conclude uh, one might say, unsurprisingly, that states are rational most of the time. This is not to say that they don't do irrational things. And a good example of that would be uh, the Bush, uh, George W. Bush invasion of Iraq in 2003. That was clearly, in our opinion, a case of non-rationality. So but we'll it, come to that uh, to, to understand that. But in, you know, in our current discourse, for example, it has been said uh, almost nonstop. Well, you know, you, Putin, he, he's, he's irrational. Uh, he thinks he's Peter the Great. Uh, he's, you know, aiming uh, in an illusion to rebuild the Russian Empire. And your argument is, no, this is not a serious way to think about uh, Russia's decision making or uh, President Putin's role in Russia's decision making. And if we think that way, we're ourselves going to be led down a, a very a dangerous and inaccurate yeah. path in, in how we deal with the global challenges. Yeah, let me say a few words about Putin, because there's no question that that's the case that almost everybody rivets on these days. Our basic argument uh, is that whether uh, a state is rational or not is largely a function of the theories that underpin the policy uh, that uh, a leader uh, is pursuing. And in other words, if a, a statesman or a leader has a cockamamie theory uh, that informs the state's policy, then that's not rational. And if you look at the case of Vladimir Putin, 
this is a pretty straightforward case of uh, Putin and virtually every Russian leader being deeply fearful of NATO expansion. And when it was first announced in April 2008 that Ukraine was going to become part of NATO, the Russians made it unequivocally clear that this was unacceptable. And Putin was in the lead in making that argument. Nevertheless, NATO continued to move eastward and to attempt to bring Ukraine into NATO. And the end result is a major crisis broke out in February 2014. And then you had the war uh, where Putin or the Russians invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. And our argument is that this is a straightforward case of balance of power politics. It's Realpolitik 101. What Putin was doing was balancing against the West. He was balancing against NATO. It's hardly surprising that this conflict has broken out. But many people who are in the war party, and of course this includes huge numbers of people in the foreign policy establishment, believe that he is a mindless imperialist. And anybody who would dare to invade Ukraine for purposes of conquering it and incorporating it into a greater Russia has to be irrational. But that's not what he was doing, right? What he was doing was balancing against NATO. And this is a perfectly rational strategy. And we should have understood that from the get-go. And the fact that we didn't is quite remarkable. And, and one of the, the pieces of uh, evidence uh, strongly in favor of your view is the memo that uh, William Burns wrote in 2008 uh, from his position as then ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to Russia. He's now the CIA director, but he wrote a memo back to the Secretary of State explaining it's, it's not just Putin against uh, uh, the NATO expansion to Ukraine. It's the entire Russian political class. Uh, and so it's a complete opposite to the kind of claim that's made that there's some delusional leader. Uh, Burns spelled it out very clearly in a, I think the memo's entitled, Niet means Niet, No means No. Now, interestingly, uh, John, just to ask you about that, that memo would never have seen the light of day, most likely, but for WikiLeaks, uh, it, it was leaked uh, in, in part of a treasure trove of uh, foreign policy documents. Uh, so much of what states do, especially the U.S., I would say, and other big powers, is secret. So how does one assess uh, this kind, the, the real decision making, what people really believe and how states are, are acting? Well, the truth is that it's very tricky to do uh, in, in real time. And when you talk about Putin and exactly what his thinking was, uh, it is not easy to put your finger on exactly what is going on. It's much easier to look at historical cases where you have a rich record and you can see what the documents and the memoirs and so forth and so on say about a particular set of leaders and what they were thinking. But I would argue in the Russian case, it's a pretty straightforward uh, instance of a leader and his lieutenants, apropos of the Bill Burns memo, saying over and over how they thought about NATO expansion and what they were going to do. There's no it mystery wasn't, It here. wasn't subtle. <laughs> no, no, it's it's actually quite remarkable. What's remarkable is that the West paid hardly any attention. Maybe we could, should say no attention to what Putin and his lieutenants were saying. They completely ignored uh, the Bill Burns memo. And I would imagine that once we get our hands on the historical documents, all the historical documents, we'll see that Burns was not the only one who was telling people uh, at the top of the Bush administration uh that this was what was going to happen. So it, it does seem to me that Russia's response to this relentless push of uh, NATO to, or of the U.S. to have NATO, a U.S.-led military alliance expand, was, uh, was rational. But maybe uh, to get to that, uh, if you could explain what 
what you uh, and uh, Sebastian uh, Rosado mean by the term rational, because it is a loaded yeah. or a, a, a debated uh, and unclear term. Uh, how do you operationalize that? And since we're talking also not about an individual decision or uh, a uh, an individual person who could be rational or delusional and so forth, but rather a state, what is a state in this context uh, specifically? And how would you assess whether the state is acting in a rational way? Yeah, this is a great question. Let me just quickly lay out my definition or my, my and Sebastian's definition of rationality and then answer your question head on. Uh, our argument is that rationality has two dimensions to it. First is the individual, and then there's the collectivity or the state. Because as you point out, you can't just focus on one individual because decisions are made by a handful of people. There's surely a leader like Putin, but Putin is surrounded by other people who have input. So it's a collective decision or a state decision. And our argument is that at the individual level, what's imperative for rationality is for individuals to have a credible theory about how the world works that underpins their view of policy. We believe that human beings are fundamentally theoretical animals. We call this homo theoreticus. I like and, that, by the way. <laughs> yes. Right. And that when you, Jeff Sachs, think about, you know, what uh, economic policy should be uh, in Washington, you think about the world as an individual in terms of theories about how the world works. You have these economic theories. And when you look at international relations, you have political theories that inform your thinking. But that's just the individual level. Then there's the collective level, right? And our argument is you're often going to run into situations where you have different individuals who have different theories and therefore favor different policies. And to get a collective decision, to get a state policy, what you have to do in our story is have a deliberative decision-making process. You can't have a process that looks like the one before the Iraq war where Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld suppressed all sorts of uh, conflicting views or views that they didn't like. You have to have a robust and coherent decision-making process. And we argue uh, in, in the Russian case that that's what happened. As you know, it, the conventional wisdom in the West is that Putin was isolated and that he made this decision to invade Ukraine all by himself. And there were all these people who disagreed with him, but he exiled them or he didn't listen to them. And it's the fact that he was a lone ranger that makes this irrational. This is wrong, we believe. And in fact, to go back to the Bill Burns memo, the Bill Burns memo makes it clear that Putin was not a loner here, that virtually everybody at the top of the foreign policy establishment in Russia agreed with Putin about NATO expansion. So our argument is, at the individual level, what you had is a set of Russian leaders, including Putin, of course, who were operating on the basis of balance of power theory, right, and therefore had a credible policy. Right. And at the collective level, they agreed on what had to be done to deal with the problem. They believed to a person, I think, that, and the Bill Burns memo confirms this, that NATO expansion into Ukraine had to be stopped. And the end result is that on February 24th, 2022, we got a war. And, you know, I think uh, one of the telling documents, again, that really supports uh, your view is the readout, or, or even the, it's almost a verbatim minutes of the Russian Security Council meeting. I think it's February 21st, uh, 2022. Yes. Uh, is that right? Yes. Uh, that uh, basically, uh, it's a very or organized meeting, uh, and President Putin lays out the issue, what shall we do, colleagues? Uh, and then he calls on Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, and then he calls on uh, other experts. Then he calls on uh, people from the regions. And you get a full readout. We very rarely get that from the United States uh, documents because these things are uh, kept secret. I think 
the Russians uh, wanted this uh, to be understood. But it's actually a very orderly deliberation, and it obviously reflects a lot of orderly processes that repeated it. It's not one person. It's not President Putin pounding the table and saying, we must do this. Quite the contrary. Uh, Lavrov explains, we made this uh, this entreaty to uh, or uh, this uh, approach to the U.S., but they sent back a document on such and such date saying they would not negotiate over NATO. And then the next one gives another answer. The next one gives another answer. And then the meeting is summed up by the president. But, it, but it's a very deliberative, orderly process that no doubt you get the feel reflects a lot of orderly attention to high stakes issues but actually through a deliberative process. Jeff, can I just jump in here and uh, reflect on one of the insights uh, from our book? Uh, a lot of people believe that when it comes to collective decision making, when you're at the state level, there's a difference between how authoritarian states and democracies operate. And uh, Almost everybody we talk to in the West believes that democracies believe in deliberation. But authoritarian states are the opposite. And what you have is one leader who runs roughshod over everybody else. And this, of course, fits with the conventional wisdom on Putin. He doesn't listen to anybody. He decides what to do. And then anybody who disagrees gets sent to the gulag and anybody who agrees gets promoted. So you have all these yes men and yes women who are operating under him. This is the way many people in the West think. Our view in looking at all these cases, and we looked at 14 cases in great detail, is that there's no difference between authoritarian states and democracies. In both cases, both sets of cases, you get a small number of people at the very top who make collective decisions. And what you discover in almost every case is when people are trying to formulate policies about grand strategy or how to deal with a particular crisis, what you see is that nobody, including the leader, is really sure what to do. And they're kind of searching around in the dark, trying to figure out what the best policy is. Therefore, leaders are prone to listen to their lieutenants about what might be a really good idea. If you take Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel today, whatever you think of Benjamin Netanyahu, he is in real trouble. The Israelis are in real trouble, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with Hamas. I am absolutely certain that Netanyahu is listening to anybody who he thinks might have a good idea about how to proceed. And someone like Naftali Bennett, who he might have terrible relations with otherwise, is a very smart man. And I'm sure that someone like Netanyahu will listen to Bennett just because Netanyahu is not sure what to do. And if Bennett has a good idea, he'll take that good idea and run with it. So my bottom line here is I don't think that Putin's behavior is any different uh, in this authoritarian state, which Russia is, than would be the case if Russia were a democracy. You, in each case, have a small number of people at the top who make decisions and have a vested interest across the board in listening to others' ideas. I think, uh, you know, I, I that really comports uh, with the, my uh, uh, perception also of China, which is very institutionalized, uh, very bureaucratic. It's, it's been an administrative state for 2,000 years with a lot of discussion, a lot of deliberation, uh, not uh, one person calling uh, any shots at all, but actually really uh, collective decision making in exactly that way. And I wonder, in, in a way, there is a, an irony that sometimes happens uh, in our democracy. I, I have a feeling, uh, let me ask you about this, you know, many of the decisions that are taken are taken absolutely against or uh, with no interest in, in American public opinion, though in our you know, self-assessment, uh, uh, democracy also means reflecting the will of the people. But on many of these issues, the people are not asked, they're told, or uh, they're ignored. But often it happens that to get some decision made in foreign policy in our ostensibly 
a public-driven process, the public is lied to. Uh, lied to about the real situation on the battlefield or lied to uh, about uh, the, uh, the real reason for going to war and so forth. And so maybe there's even more secrecy and less deliberation in the democratic setting in some cases because you, you don't speak the truth. I mean, the, the lead up to the Iraq war was a desire of a small group to have a, a war to overthrow Saddam Hussein on pretextual reasons uh, that turned out to be completely false, maybe even more false than they, they believed. But certainly they uh, were not very much interested in the evidence that, that they were purporting to uh, give to the American people. So it was a deception. And because of the deception, I'm just wondering whether maybe the deliberation is even cut short in such context because too much talk, too much deliberation lets too much of the public in and they didn't want to let the public in. Yeah, l let me uh, directly address this issue, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about. First of all, in the book that Sebastian and I have written on how states think, what we discovered is that public opinion, what the public thinks, domestic politics, uh, and so forth and so on, matters hardly at all in the decision-making process. The elites, a small number of elites, get together and they make the decision. We were actually surprised by this finding. We didn't go in uh, thinking that this was a question we should address, how much domestic politics matters. But we discovered in looking at 14 cases and looking in a cursory way at a lot of other cases that domestic politics doesn't matter. That's point one. Point two is there's no It's amazing. It's a stunning finding and a very <laughs> important one. Yes. And again, it wasn't one that we went in asking about, a question we at, went into the book asking about. Okay. Second point is that if you are in a democracy and you make a particular decision, you have to sell it to the public. There's no question about that. That's not as necessary in an autocracy. It's not to say it's completely unnecessary because public opinion does matter somewhat, but it's definitely necessary in a democracy. Now, I wrote an earlier book called Why Leaders Lie. And the principal finding in that book is that leaders do not lie very much to other leaders, and they lie mainly to their publics. Yep. And you get more lying in democracies than in okay. autocracies. There you go. I, there you go. I believe that. I really believe that. <laughs> and, and And I think... Sometimes you just feel it's it's a nonstop narrative and deception, and, and you know one of the uh, senior people in uh, in the Biden administration on another issue, and I don't want to say who and what and what the context was, but uh, I I said, well, you know, have you weighed in on this? And they said, no, uh, you, you know, only only the the spin guys uh, in in the White House uh, have any any role in that right now. It's all about narrative, how you pitch it, not what the substance is. This was, you know, is there really that deliberation over that particular issue? And, and there was very little, actually. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, when I wrote Why Leaders Lie, and I would go around the country and I would tell people that leaders do not lie much to each other. People found that hard to believe, right? And then when I said that leaders in democracies are especially prone to lying to their publics, people found that hard to believe. But I would just say to you, the reason that people in democracies or the people inside a country are easy to lie to is because those people tend to trust their government. Because after mm. all, it is your government. You expect them to protect you. They're your leaders. So they're primed to be deceived. When you're dealing with foreign leaders, they don't trust each other to begin with. 
We don't trust Putin. Putin doesn't trust us. And this goes back to 2000 when he took power, right? It's not just now in 2023. So given that there's not much trust to begin with, you really can't get away with lying at the international level like you can at the domestic level. Oh, that's yeah, that's that's really something. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011. Typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up, the truth. What do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. So how do you create this miracle? Because even the possible uh, alternative to Biden is Trump or somebody from the Republican. They are in certain aspects even more radical pro-Israeli than the Democrats. Uh, how to overcome this tiny problem? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the pressure has to come from inside the United States and from outside. Uh, from inside, public opinion absolutely does not accept the administration line on this. This is very clear in opinion survey after opinion survey. So somebody in the White House uh, concerned about uh, Biden's reelection must be reading this uh, and must be understanding this is just purely bad tactics from a U.S. political point of view. That's very important. Uh, there's lots of protest in the United States uh, and uh, lots of uh, unhappiness with this. So we're not in any way locked in internally to the politics. It's bad for Biden. Uh, it's bad for U.S. interests. Uh, it's against public opinion. Um, and so this is uh, one point that I would make. It's not like the United States is rousing support. Yes, and it's impossible to turn. Uh, it's actually deeply contested and mainly opposed. Though I acknowledge that in Washington, the pro-Israel lobby has always been very powerful. The military industrial complex is very powerful. And the inertia is also powerful. So I'm not saying it's easy. Now, on the outside, the entire world uh, is basically aligned on this side with one important footnote, which is that uh, a few European countries uh, maybe are not aligned. I don't know what the Austrian government's real position is. Sometimes it's uh, don't you know side with the U.S. or maybe it really is uh, because of more right wing uh, view or whatever. Uh, side with Israel, but it's very few. The problem in Europe is European politicians stop telling the truth about almost anything years ago because all they want to do is side with the United States. And mm -hmm. I think I would just say to European politicians, if you do it, you lose at the polls. There isn't a popular government in Europe right now that it, because it's incredible. This is so much against European, Europe's own political interests. So I would say, think through this honestly, and then say, you know, it's right. We need, we're not against Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just need to move to a two state solution. And the United States, you know, come over here, buddy. You know it too. Let's let's move to a real solution. I'm waiting for European politicians to regain two feet on the ground, their head out of the clouds or out of uh, U.S. control, 
and just state clearly, straightforwardly what is right and also what happens to be in Europe's interests. But by the way, what happens to be in Israel's interests as well, because nothing that's happening is uh, doing anything other than gravely threatening Israel's long-term survival. This messianism, this greater Israel idea, this zealotry of this religious group, this is not saving Israel. This is threatening Israel's survival. So I want European leaders just to think clearly and honestly about this, because that'll also help the United States get to the right place. I think there is a lot to say about the European leaders. I think the, the European leaders, uh, uh, there are no leaders, you, you know it better. And there is another tiny problem. We will have also an election this year in some European countries, uh, but in the European Union for the European Parliament. And the problem is that everybody, if according to most of the polls, it's to foresee that the right-wing uh, European nationalistic right-wing parties will win. And the problem is they are even at least Concerning Israel, they are also in the meantime, also many of their parties, if to go back history, you know where they come from. And this is a historic cynicism. I think that these right-wing uh, fascist parties, now they are on side of Israel, which is yeah. unbelievable for anybody who knows history and who knows how things uh, happened that these parties who are sometimes in internal uh, issues, they are racistic, they are fascist to it right today. But when it comes to Israel, they are supporting the Jewish state. Yeah, you know, su supporting the Jewish state is, uh, um, is one thing. Supporting what is called greater Israel to dominate the Palestinians is so uh, senseless for Israel and for Europe uh, that uh, everybody should take a deep breath and understand that. How many self wounds does Europe want? How many crises, how many wars does Europe want around it? Uh, and I would ask uh, the European leaders, you know, th the reason why the right is growing is in part because the so-called center or center left all was gung ho with the United States for NATO enlargement and for the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it's been a disaster for Europe. It's been a disaster economically for Europe. It's been a disaster from a security point of view for Europe. So it's not even left right. It's it's a failure policy that the current European governments have pursued, and they are opening up their way for an opposition to arise. Uh, and that's that's what's happening, in fact. So the reason European politicians, by the way, across the board, you, you look at the approval ratings in Western Europe right now or in the EU, nobody has any support, basically, except the few that stand up for themselves, like Orban or, uh, or Fico or uh, mm -hmm. a, a few others. But the ones that are basically just siding with the United States in this useless Ukraine war are all in their 20% approval ratings or 25% approval ratings and so on. So the main point I would say to Europe is if you go the way not of supporting Israel, that's one thing, but supporting greater Israel for ethnic cleansing and for this terrible thing, all you're doing is making another prolonged disaster on Europe's borders. And if that's in Europe's interest, boy, please explain it to me. This is this is no doubt about it. I think uh, Europe, I think with this uh, policy they, they uh, followed the last uh, tens of years, I think they, it's against their own security, economic, even cultural interests. I think this is something uh, which- You know, I'll give you another example, by the way. Uh, the, the, the politics of the 2010s 
was dominated uh, by the Syrian refugees. And anyone that knows even the slightest history should understand that uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011, typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. And so European politicians should think about how to defuse a Mideast wide war. You are, you are completely right. I think you convince uh, people like me, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> We are not in uh, in power, and uh, uh, but coming back to uh, the issue of this uh, uh, interview, I think now there is a, a a peace plan. It's even economically we didn't even mention it, but uh, which is interesting for me since you are uh, uh, also uh, long experienced in economy. I think um, one uh, important but not so much debated uh, uh, proposal is uh, the establishment of a new UN fund, uh, uh, a UN Reconstruction and Sustainable Development Fund, which, which is uh, interesting, should partially, at least partially, funded by reduction of expenses which traditionally have been spent for armament and war. You know, uh, uh, outside the UN, across the street uh, from uh, headquarters, is what they call Isaiah's Wall, uh, which is the inscription of uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, which says uh, they uh, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, nations uh, will not uh, uh, make war uh, uh, on uh, other nations, neither will they teach war anymore, I'm uh, paraphrasing. But, uh, you know, Isaiah had the idea in the 8th century BCE of the uh, transforming the military to the civilian use. Uh, and uh, we're now spending two and a half trillion dollars a year worldwide on the military. The United States is around 40% of the world spending, shocking because we're four percent of the world's population. Uh, what if we take even ten percent of that? Would be two hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, so two and a half. Uh, I'm sorry, two hundred fifty billion a year. Uh, and so that's the proposal: uh, create a fund, funded by uh, basically uh, agreed cutbacks in armaments. I should mention that uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, in his encyclical uh, Populorum Progressio in uh, 1967, had that idea. So I don't want to claim uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, uh, precedence uh, to this, but I do think it's the right idea. The UN in general does not command much in financial resources. Uh, it needs to have a bigger budget to do good things. And uh, one way would be military cutbacks that are rechanneled to sustainable development. We could continue hours and hours and hours since uh, many things have been already uh, discussed uh, for many years. But it's interesting that now this plan is here. I think, uh, do you have any uh, ideas how to make it even more popular? Do you uh, intend to present it to other international bodies? Uh, and how should this come to reality? 
I'm uh, discussing uh, these ideas with UN diplomats uh, all the time. Uh, and I've discussed it with the uh, Palestinian uh, diplomats and with diplomats from around uh, the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of resonance with this. I personally am continuing to urge an immediate membership of Palestine in the UN uh, as a UN member state. Um, by the way, Palestine is a state recognized by 140 uh, other states, but it is not recognized as a UN member state, uh, only an observer, as you rightly pointed out. So I am continuing my own discussion of this um, basically uh, with the U.S. government, they don't talk to me too much, uh, but I uh, try to make my views uh, known uh, publicly uh, by uh, writing and posting uh, articles all the time. Um, and uh, I'm writing to politicians in the U.S. who are quite resistant in general because uh, uh, their modus operandi for decades has been never show any any space at all with Israel, but I'm telling them it's not working. Uh, it's not working from any point of view. You need to rethink this. So they have a few days of rethinking before the Congress uh, comes back. Uh, the White House cannot be uh, very comfortable. We hear lots of stories about pretty harsh talks between the U.S. and Israel right now. I believe that that's true. One of the U.S. Uh, carrier groups <coughs> has been withdrawn from the Eastern Mediterranean and is on its way back to the U.S. That is a signal that the U.S. does not want a wider war in the Middle East. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. The U.S. is exhausted of war and an election year. Uh, it would uh, be the end of uh, Biden's chances at all. So uh, this is the time for pushing the politics because it's a case where the right thing to do, the politically expedient thing to do uh, are the same. Uh, and so I'm gonna continue to push hard on that. Do you have any hope in, I think you mentioned it and everybody knows it, I think two thirds of the international uh, states are in favor of this kind of political and economic uh, solution, unfortunately. Uh, they don't have any veto uh, at the UN. But there is something else. There is an uh, increasing number of states working together, I think. Uh, and the South African move to the international court is interesting because South Africa, on the other side, is one of the leading uh, member states of this newly established group, the BRICS uh, group. Uh, so. And they have even already established a kind of new banking system, financing system. Do you have any indications or ideas that from this side, uh, more than just political statements will come to support your suggestions? Well, the, the BRICS countries, all of them are on the same side that I've been advocating, uh, China, Russia. Uh, South Africa, uh, India has expressed uh, also uh, some clarity on this, um, Brazil certainly, um, and now you have new BRIC states that have just joined, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Iran. It's a powerful group. Uh, they're all on uh, this side. Uh, actually, it's interesting for me, the fact that Iran is now a BRICS member is, is actually going to moderate uh, Iran, make it uh, part of what could be a BRICS-wide consensus uh, on uh, a good solution. So this matters because uh, the U.S. also looks out and says, you know, our diplomacy, we're isolated, whereas China's and Russia's diplomacy is growing in the region. This cannot make anyone happy, and we know that in the U.S. State Department, there's a lot of unhappiness about the U.S. administration policy. We don't hear all the details, but it boils over uh, every few weeks. And so we hear about the protests coming from inside the professional diplomatic service of the United States as well. So I wouldn't give up 
uh, in any way on uh, a political change where the United States one day says, you know, we, we need to move forward to a real solution here. Uh, this is uh, where I think uh, uh, it's very appropriate and timely to think straight. And if the European leaders are too afraid to say it in public, they should be saying it, they should be saying it in private to their American counterparts. They should, yeah. So I think it's time. I think we exceeded a little bit our usual limit. So thank you very much, Professor Sachs. I think it was very interesting. It's important. And I think we should really invest more and more time to publish these ideas and maybe even outside the usual normal circles we have in New York, in Brussels, uh, because the world is much bigger and in the long run more, more or less more powerful than the world which runs the business till now, but it will come to an end. And the Palestinian-Israeli issue could be, we forgot something, because the Palestinian issue, what is it in, in history? It's a colonial problem. It, it's it's it. one it's one of the last unsolved colonial problems, and it's more than hundred years after formerly colonialism was ended. It's time to deal with the remaining rests, and Israel Palestine is one, and this should be uh, one of our ambitions to to.